Five minutes after I get a call, John. Hey boss, the kitchen's on fire. Like, I can't breathe. You know, my heart is racing, feels like it's coming out of my chest. And my landlord, Steve, he said, well, hey man, you know, you can get a fresh star. Insurance will take care of you. And I'm like, I'm fucked, Steve. Steve, I don't have insurance. And he's like, oh, you're fucked. For about two months there, I got into depression, drinking heavily. My restaurant burned down. I lost hope. I thought, all these dreams that I've had all my life, these are just, you know, crazy stories and fantasy world. This is real life. I think everybody has a, a moment in their lives where they get to that point where it's like, it doesn't seem like life is going to ever turn around, but it's up to you if you want to keep going or if you want to stop there. You know, one day I opened my laptop and I said, you're supposed to make me money, show me how. And, uh, and I just went for it, man. And first product, started making money. Second product, started making money. I was like, shit, this is something, you know? And uh, this year so far, I've done a little over 12 million. question is, what was one of the simplest decisions you made in your business that made all other decisions easier? Focus. Focus. What do you mean by that? Um, focus on one thing and just literally one thing and one thing only. Keith Carnavali was a man that told me, uh, that introduced the, uh, the, the uh, concept of KISS, keep it simple, stupid, into my life in 2013, 2014. I used to run a restaurant and, uh, and there was anything and everything in that restaurant. I mean, the, you would walk in and it's like, what is this place again? <laughs> you know? Um, and he said, dude, you need to keep it KISS. I was like, what is that? He said, you need to keep it simple, stupid. He was calling me stupid. And then when I started, you know, when that restaurant burned to the ground, literally, um, I, you know, when I got into Amazon and got online and started coaching, I wanted to do everything. And then it just wasn't catching up. And I was like, what's going on? And then I remembered Keith's, you know, uh, uh, saying, keep it simple, stupid and focus. And once I did that, just everything transformed for me. The focus, when you got in the online world, um, you first at the restaurant, then you said in the online world, was it that you were trying like e-commerce, drop shipping, coaching done for you? Or was it like, you know, multiple different offers? Where were you unfocused in the, when you first started the business? So it wasn't that part because I think if you don't know what you're trying to do and you just start, I think you need to start different things sure. until you find your thing. And I so agree. when I first went online, I had never done anything online. I had a Facebook page that I literally posted on like once every six months. <laughs> um, but once I did go online, I needed to try everything until Amazon uh, 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 got in. But then after, when it came to like trying to do other things, let's say, you know, Amazon uh, does over 53% of all online sales happen on Amazon. And I wanted to do a Shopify store and I also wanted to run ads to my store and I also wanted to do this other thing and this thing, you know. And then when I wanted to do consulting, I looked online and it's, you know, Gary Vee was the loudest and he said that you need to post on Twitter and, and Instagram and Facebook and start a podcast and do this thing and do that thing. And I was like, all right, 65 times posting a day it is, you know. <laughs> And then I was like, this, there's so much output going out and not as much input. And that's when I realized that I needed to really just find a thing that I enjoy most and then just stick to it and then keep scaling that thing uh, as vertical as possible. Yeah, I remember when we had dinner uh, a few months ago and I was, you were telling me how the business was going. And I was like, and you told me where you wanted to go. And I was like, so what's the plan to get there? And you're like, oh, just more of the same. You yeah. know, it was like just so simple and uh, and I'm excited to get into it. So so let's dive into, so I've had the absolute pleasure, Bashar, of having you at my house with your lovely wife as well. Um, one of the best nights we've eaten dinner here. I really appreciate your presence there. And I learned quite a bit from talking with you, but probably one of my favorite favorite conversations we had that night and arguably one of the favorite like origination stories was kind of how you got started not a lot of people were restaurant owners and like how that ended and how you know your journey started you know running an eight-figure online business so if you could tell people that are listening right now that don't necessarily know who you are before we get into obviously the business success online what were you doing previously to the online world how did you get uh, set up here so um i've always worked in restaurants and operated restaurants. Um, I migrated to the U.S. in 2006. I was 16 years old, and um, my first job was at McDonald's. Uh, I lived in Detroit for a year, and then once we moved to California in 2007, I also worked at McDonald's. And then after I worked at a Greek restaurant for three years, so for five years, five and a half years, all I did was restaurants. And then the first business my family and I started in, in America was a pizzeria, <laughs> so it was also in a restaurant. And then a year and a half later, I decided that I wanted, you know, I, I was 22 at the time, 23, 
And I was like, you know what? This is awesome. I can party. I can <laughs> have a good time and, and run a business all at the same place. Like it doesn't get any better than this. And um, and I had only done restaurants prior to that. And so I was like, all right, this is probably like my thought was I'm probably going to stay in the hospitality industry. Sure. And you know, pref uh, like specifically restaurants and bars and that kind of stuff. And so that's why I got into restaurants and, um, you know, it was a nice place. The potential was there. The, the, the plan in my head, the vision in my head was until now, I think was incredible, but the execution sucked, you know, and, and this has a lot to do with, you know, and we can go in there if you want, but it, it's got a lot to do with big ego, no experience, you know, no one could tell me what to do. I knew it all, you know? And uh, so it wasn't just the lack of experience, but the unwillingness to learn. And, and how old were you at that time? 23. And were you literally physically running the day-to-day? -day? Would your parents own the restaurant? Like So the, the first one, yes, it was a family thing. Got it. Uh, it was my, uh, myself, my brother, and it was my, at the time, 60-something-year-old mom and 70-something-year-old dad. Um, so it was four of us running it, and my brother's friend also came to, to help us, who was living with us at the time. Um, and then when I got my restaurant, that was just my, it was just my thing. And so I was the, the owner, you know, operator, but you know, I, I was working 120 hours a week <laughs> for three years. Uh, I was the first guy in last guy out and, um, uh, had 65 different hats. You know, I was the manager in the kitchen and the bar and here and there. Um, and the way I even got into it. I had been watching Bar Rescue by John Taffer for, yeah. for six months, and I thought I was an expert at running restaurants. And I was like, I got this, you know? And so I would watch, all right, this is what he did. I'm going to go and I'm going to do it, you know? That's so funny because uh, when I tell people about the story of me almost becoming a lawyer, all of my research on becoming a lawyer was just from watching the um, TV show Suits and Law and Order. That <laughs> was like the only things, like the TV show, yeah. I thought that was it, you know, <laughs> and I think I was in for a rude awakening. You touched on briefly, like a little bit of your pride and ego and unwillingness mm -hmm. to learn. Like, so um, you, you create this on your own restaurant and this is not your family's anymore. What did you feel... You know, my dad came from India originally, uh, yeah. and he moved here when he was 18 with nothing in his pocket, created an amazing business. And, like, so we've talked about it before, and I know that he had something to prove to his family back home, like himself, his family here. Uh, and obviously, I know that you immigrated as well. So was that a part of it? Was it just like, oh, here, like, here's my parents' business. I'm going to go out on my own and prove them I'm better. Was it just because you were young and a guy? Like, where, where was kind of this uh, ego coming in, and how was it hindering the growth of yourself in the business? My dad was a very successful entrepreneur in Iraq. He owned the second largest factory of clothing in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. Oh, wow. But after the Gulf War of 91, um, the uh, the economy just collapsed. And uh, uh, the U.S. dollar used to be, well, actually, one Iraqi dinar used to equal three U.S. dollars. Literally overnight, it went to one dollar to equal twelve hundred dinars. Wasn't there like some kind of dinar, like uh, yeah. money thing? I yeah. remember at one yeah. point I got hurt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so my dad went from worthing like thirty, forty, fifty million dollars in like nineteen eighty nine or something like that to literally nothing wow. overnight. Wow. And so him coming up, um, he was very confident always. He was the he was the third oldest of nine. Um, he put all of his, you know, uh, kid brothers and sisters through college, although he had zero college degree. Um, he was just always good at what he did. And he was very passionate and he had uh, an amazing work ethic, which is what I really like, what I admire about him. But he also had a huge ego and it wasn't just him, it was his entire family. Like my uncles, you know, my aunts, they all have big egos, you know? And I think it was just the thing that ran in the family. And so when I saw my, like when I would envision my dad, I would see him. He was like a mover. He was a shaker. And I wanted to be like, him. I wanted to become powerful, you know? And, um, and then so when I went into my restaurant business, I carried all that with me. And he used to literally tell me, he said, look, it, there's a fine line between you and your employees. They can never become your friends. If you guys ever go out for a beer, you can never tell them what to do anymore. They're going to become your friends. And so for me, like it was a battle because it's like, Dude, I'm like 23. I want to hang out with these guys. Sure. I want to go out with these guys, you know? But it was my dad always in the back of my mind. And he would see me talking to them. And he would be like, stop talking to your employees. Do you still think that's the case? Do you yeah. still think? Oh, today? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, okay. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, yeah. That, that was uh, that was just put, put, put away after my restaurant burned down. And after the day of my restaurant burn, burning down, um, I had a, 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 an employee that I had fired a few months prior. He texted me. It was a pizzeria as well. He texted me. He's like, 
I bet that pizza is pretty well done. Ha ha, asshole. <laughs> the same, literally two hours after my restaurant had burned down. That's too good. That's yeah. actually, uh, my dad went through a similar experience to your dad as well. Uh, I won't say that it's nearly the same as what you went through, but something similar where built a lot of wealth and then unfortunately lost it. Um, how, how was, just because I'm kind of curious, how did that affect your financial security today? Like when you saw that, did that, and I don't want to veer too off topic, but I just want to ask even for my own personal curiosity, like for me, when I saw that happen, it made me very, I'm obviously risk prone because I built the business sure. and like, but at the same time, I'm always like, all right, I need this amount of money just yeah. in case, like under my mattress in case all this shit hits. Did that happen to you as well when you saw that? It's funny because um, I I started working with a performance coach not too long ago. And then every quarter we'll take like two days where we do one-on-one uh, uh, immersion where it's just no phones, nothing, just me and her. And, uh, and, and literally half of our conversation last time, which was about three weeks ago, was about, am I a little bitch when it comes to money? <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I, we need to talk about this money thing. She's like, why? I'm like, so I've got, and this, I think it goes back to focus. I have zero investments. I don't own anything. I have a bunch of cash in the bank and I've got a very profitable business, a multi eight figure a year business. And, um, and that's it. I literally have zero assets. I, I lease my car. I rent my home. Um, I don't have any stock. I've got some crypto, but that's only because our clients have paid us with crypto <laughs> and I've just kind of left it there. I don't even know what's in it, you know? And um, every time I hear like people talk about, you know, creating your wealth and, and, and investing and stuff like that, at first it was, no, I want to focus. Because in 2019, after having followed Grant Cardone for the longest time, it was like almost like peer pressure. Yeah. Like, don't be a little bitch, invest your money. <laughs> if your money, you know, your money's useless unless it's used, you know? And and I had like, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand in the bank. And I'm like, okay, I need to do something with that. And for the longest time, I'm like studying real estate. And then after six months, I'm like, dude, I'm spending 10, 15 hours a week learning something I'm not passionate about because I've got a couple hundred thousand, like it's not even worth it. What am I going to buy with this? Especially in California, I was living at sure. the time, you know? And then I was like, what if I just put all this time back into my business that's growing 20, 30% per month, you know? And that's where I was like, all right, I just need to leave this alone. But then now it's like, well, why aren't you doing something else? And so is it focus or is it that fear that your father once lost and now you're afraid? And so we were kind of working on I'm, I'm packing that. So the, the, the short answer is yes and no. You know, I think I, I have my own, I've created my own wisdom, you know, um, because one thing that I was telling my, my mentor, Sam Ovens, is we learn, like, I value mentors a ton. And there is, I mean, I, what I've learned from my mentors, I, I, there's no price I can put on it. But what I've learned more is in what not to do than what to do. And so looking back at my dad, it's like, all right, this is how he ran his life. This is how he ran his business, how he ran everything. This is what I need to do. But all these things are things that I need to not do, right? And this is where I was like, all right, I need to make sure that I don't do these things in my life. And I think that has a lot to do with it as well. I think that was so well said. And I, I'm so happy we can have this conversation because I literally have this conversation with other seven and eight figure entrepreneurs all the time. <laughs> and it's the exact same situation. It's like, you know, how do you decide like when is enough? Like you got to, everyone knows you got to stay focused, right? I think anybody that's at the eight figure level knows that it's about focus, right? Yeah. But then at the same time, you have this money piling up and then you're thinking, okay, I, essentially, in my eyes, what you're doing is weighing opportunity cost. Right. Is the opportunity cost of taking my eye off the business and investing this money, uh, is that greater or less than if I stayed on the business yes. and ignored the money's time? Right. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't think anybody knows the actual answer to it, right? right. I know in uh, when I paid my tax bill in 2020, I was like, all right. Like, that was my first seven-figure tax bill. And I was like, okay, I got to figure this uh, this out because I couldn't do this again. So I ended up going, like, I indexed way on the other side. Sure. And I spent, got these uh, advisors and, yeah. like, you know, just went crazy into it. And like you said, I was, like, 20 hours a week doing this stuff. And I was like, oh, my God. If, like, and how dr how energy draining and it's were those not even like it, it's not even like you're done with it once you're do it's like you have to every year you got to do yeah. something else you yeah. got you know what yeah. I mean and it's yeah. like yeah exactly what you said energy draining and you're just you feel like you know what you're doing in your world of business and then you go in this other world over here it's and you're like, just like this little this kid and which I love learning right yeah. but it's like how applicable is this stuff later on and then of course everybody's like well you got to be careful because of this and this you know it's a little gray <laughs> line and I just think it's so funny because I don't know if there is a um a right time to like start deploying the assets. Can I touch on something Yeah, here? I'd love to. Yeah, of so course. So there is this uh, phrase that I came up with, get there syndrome. 
<laughs> and um, and this is something that us, especially younger entrepreneurs, we have this FOMO that I need to f- get it all figured out today. And I think that's where it all stems from. It's that, oh shit, I paid seven figures in taxes last year. I need to save money. Dude, you're fucking 23, 30 years old, whatever. You know, it's like, who cares how much you pay in taxes? This Are you going to die next year? Yeah. Is your business going to go out of business next month? Like sometimes my marketing team comes to me and they're like, hey man, you know, we need to do this thing. I'm like, all right, we just started split testing this. Let's wait another two weeks. But we're going to waste two weeks. I'm like, okay. We're building a business that's going to be there a hundred years from now. Like, yeah. who cares if we take another two weeks? And I think this is uh, very important that I just realized in working with my performance coach. She talks about how every human has wisdom inside of them. And oftentimes because of all the mainstream medium and social media, we have so many messages that we get every single day. If we just sit back and settle and allow all the crazy thoughts to go away and and, and kind of like connect our body with our mind and, and, and just really listen to our wisdom, you'll see, you'll hear that wisdom come up. And like earlier, it's like, yeah, I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe now I think that what I'm doing is right. In five years, I'm going to look back and say, that was stupid. Yep. But you know what? Who cares? It's the, it's the, it's just so well said. And it's just every person I know that has that level of confidence. It's simply for one reason. It's not that they know things that other people don't. It's just that they have a longer term vision. That's all it is. It's just like, you may not know, and I may not know, but like you said, if I'm trying to get there now, I'm much more stressed out about it. And I may make a mistake where you're like, I'll figure it out. I got 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years to figure it out. And what you said earlier, I actually, so, um, uh, ironically enough, I made an invest uh, investment in cryptocurrency uh, recently in a company that went bankrupt. And so my funds are like locked up inside of there. Oh, wow. And it made me go back and like, I was like, okay, I, I mean, most of my life I have frameworks for things. I have frameworks for business. I have frameworks for my personal life, how I make it just so my decision-making process is easier, right? Yeah. Just easy. It falls in this category, do this thing. And I realized that I had none for investing. And so the first thing I wrote down was exactly kind of the theme what you're talking about here was that it is okay to hold cash. Like it is like you are pressured in every and if you're listening to this right now, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting to get cash, everyone's gonna try to grab that cash from you. Yeah. Right. But it is actually okay to hold cash. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Like it is actually okay. You're not gonna miss out on anything because like you're not gonna time the market. And once again, I think that I don't know, I think there's momentum in business. And I think that if you like go you, t- you take your foot off the pedal and you go d- to this other direction right now, all that energy that you just had going this is now being stopped by almost this invisible brick wall of this like area that you don't have rutted out. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on really quickly the the fire burning down because I thought that was like, you know, that was my favorite part of that story. You know, n- n- no offense. But um, so you're, the bit, you're doing the business. You think you're hot shit. Everything's going well. What happened with the fire? How did that transform your life a little bit? Walk me through that. And if I remember correctly, you were on a date with your now wife, I think. So yeah, walk me through what happened there. Well, first of all, Nothing was going great. <laughs> I you guess know? you thought, yeah. yeah, I guess yeah. That's so, <laughs> and, and when people hear this this part of the story, like, okay, so you burnt in, got you know, got paid by insurance. I'm like, no, I actually didn't have insurance. <laughs> you know, and so um, maybe six months into the whole venture, I realized that I didn't know what the hell I was doing because um, I was driving to the restaurant in the morning, and then Trish called me. She was my restaurant manager, and she said, um, "Hey, my check, ba- my bank called, and they said the check bounced." I'm like, check bounced. The hell do you mean check balance? So I open my my app and then I you know I log into my online banking. I think I had Chase or no not Chase Wells Fargo at the time, and sure enough it was like negative. And I was like negative. What the fuck, dude? I I thought I had money, you know. And then so the the listener is probably thinking, how did you not know how much money you had? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's like what the hell did I have anything to do with starting a business? Um. We got that figured out. And then, so this was about six months in. That's when I realized that, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, Bills started piling up. We were spending a lot more than we were making. And we hadn't even started remodeling because I bought a dive rundown restaurant. And the plan was turn it around, you know, rename it, do the whole thing, because this is what John Taffer yeah, did. Right? Your bar, yeah, yeah, you're saying true, John, to you're so true to it. You're saying true to it. I was like, John Taffer, you know? <laughs> And I was like, and then I had budgeted 50,000, budgeted in my mind, not, not actual, you know, the first time someone told me, do you have a budget? I was like, what's that? <laughs> you know? And um, 
And then I, I, I remember a few nights after I get on a call with my contractor at like 10 o'clock at night and he gives me this plan and this budget of 275,000. And that's, that was, I think one of the first times that I almost felt like I died and then came back again, wow. you know, I was like, what? Like I couldn't even swallow. I'm like 275,000 for what? You know, I'm like, I'm thinking 50K. I don't even have the 50K, you know? <laughs> I'm like, all right, I can come up with 50K somehow, 275,000. And then we started cutting corners. Okay, don't do this, don't do that. Don't get a permit, you know? Just close the walls, you know, close the windows, <laughs> remodel at night. And so what I would do is I would um, I would be working uh, 48 to 49 hour shifts. What I would do is I would go open close and then my cousin, my brother, and my other employee would come over at night. And we would remodel overnight. We'd oh clean, open up. I would open, close, and then go home and sleep. And then I would do that again. <laughs> and uh, and so I, I learned how to frame walls, lay tiles. I mean, like I can build this entire room for you if you wanted, you know? <laughs> and um, uh, so again, I realized that I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, um, two months prior to the fire, um, my brother decided to shut down our pizzeria, which me and him and our parents decided to, to you know, we're running before. So the family pizzeria. The fi family pizzeria. And that was a successful business. That did very well. But after I left, he just didn't want to run it by himself anymore. My parents got tired and, and he just wanted to do something else. So that same Keith guy came back and was like, hey, man, you know, why don't you, uh, because obviously what you're doing isn't working. You've got too much competition. What about you bring that concept here? Because that worked. So I'm like, cool. So we we bring my brother's uh, equipment, we install it here, we change everything, we literally redo everything. First time in my life that I actually hire someone, which was that Keith guy, he came on as a consultant, uh, which by the way, he offered me $200,000 three months prior. He said, I'll give you 200,000 cash, give me the restaurant and get the hell out of here. I said, go fuck yourself. Wow. I should have taken that money to <laughs> ran. You know? Um, we redid the place. We we were averaging about twenty to $25,000 a month in revenue for a long time. What was the concept change that they were so the other restaurant from did? Everything? Yeah. Like burgers, barbecue, sushi, Mediterranean, everything Got it. to now just and then also I was trying to on Fridays I had DJ and we had a mechanical bull. So I'd have girls and like <laughs> topless, you know, on top of the bull. And then I'm trying to cater to schools <laughs> in the morning. And so that didn't work. You know, it was a very tight knit community. And it's like, yeah, we're seeing your post on Facebook. Like I'm not gonna bring my kids here. And so, um, and then so we went completely family oriented, changed the name, changed everything, remodeled, and um, and that worked. Wow. Uh, first month after, uh, we did forty seven thousand. Second month, we were targeting for sixty seven thousand, and then we were just going to be scaling. Um, and so, one of the pizza ovens uh, was like sixty five thousand years old. Uh, we had like because I didn't have money, I hired some Joe Schmo to do the piping and all that. So it was five p.m. April twenty eighth, two thousand fifteen. Um, I had just left the restaurant, so this wasn't overnight. Anyone is saying, you know, I I put I lit the fire five o'clock in the afternoon, you know, full restaurant. I had just left. I think it was a Tuesday. I went to pick up my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and uh, five minutes after, I get a call. John, hey boss, the kitchen's on fire. Okay, we've got an extinguisher, man. Put it out. How bad is it? It's like no, boss. We're all outside, and the fire department is here. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. So I messaged my girlfriend. I'm like, hey, something happening. I go back like seven, eight fire engines, smoke, everything. So I go down and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm like, I can't breathe. You know, my heart is racing, feels like it's coming out of my chest. And I'm just thinking like, dear God, please make sure that like, this is not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. I want to go inside and they're not letting me in. I'm like, okay, it's bad. Wow. Um, and I'm standing outside. I'm like sweating. I'm crying. I'm just all emotions all at the same time. And my landlord, Steve, uh, comes next to me and he said, well, hey man, you know, you can get a fresh star. Insurance will take care of you. And I'm like, Steve, I look at Steve and Steve is looking at me and I'm like, I'm fucked, Steve. He's like, why? I'm like, Steve, I don't have insurance. And he's like, oh, you're fucked. And I don't know what he was thinking. I hadn't paid him rent in like three months. No. Um, so he walked away and um, and I went inside, uh, I go to the kitchen and, and firefighters, they come and they just tear everything because they don't want to make sure, first it's a historic uh, building. It's like built in 1800s. So they want to make sure that like the fire hasn't spread. And so the kitchen is destroyed, the place is all smoky, you know, everything, the, all the walls are just, you know, uh, there's like ash everywhere and it's just messy and the smell. And my dad comes and he overhears a conversation outside that Steve is telling everyone this dumbass doesn't have insurance. And uh, my dad comes in and he's like, he's like, you haven't paid insurance? I'm like, no. 
And I could just see the, the look on my dad's face. And so just to kind of go back a little bit, for the longest time, we were, we looked wealthy when we lived in Iraq because we had a fancy house. We had, my dad had properties because his business was doing well. But after the, the crash, the economy crash, we were pretty much poor because he didn't have a cash flowing business. And so after the war in 2003, when we actually migrated to Iraq, my dad had, was, was able to liquidate some of his properties and he had transferred $200,000 into my bank, which is how I bought that place. And this was my college fund because my mom wanted me to become a doctor. My dad said, do whatever you want. I said, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to retire you and mom. I'm going to be the guy that's going to take care of the family. You, you, it's been 20 years. You've been trying. Hasn't worked. I'm going to take care of you. I got you. And this is when he, you know, like he looked at me. He's like, you do realize this was the last $200,000 I had, right? I'm like, I know. And um, every time I tell the story, I get pretty emotional. But I, for six months after that, just lost respect. He wouldn't even look at me in the eyes. He, you know, I would walk in home. He would turn around, go up to his room, you know? And um, yeah, man, it was, it was a tough time, you know? Um, and for about two months there, I got into depression, drinking heavily, grew my beard, which is how the mustache came about. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I got a DUI, which was, you know, a uh, byproduct of drinking all the time. And uh, um, for about two months there, I lost hope. I thought all these dreams that I've had all my life, these are just, you know, crazy stories and fantasy world. This is real life. This is what people go through. This is the stuff that don't that that John Taffer didn't talk about in the in, in Bar Rescue. This is real life shit. This is my life pretty much, you know. And uh, 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 but finally, you know, one day I opened my laptop and I said, "You're supposed to make me money. Show me how." And and things changed from there. But I think everybody has a, a moment in their lives where they get to that point where it's like it doesn't seem like life is going to ever turn around, but it's up to you if you want to keep going or if you want to stop there, you know? Yeah, I loved, and I think we even talked about that at my house that night is just like, I've gone through some really difficult times in my life and, and obviously you have as well. And it's just, even no matter your personal development, almost always there is at least a split second where you're just like, fuck, this is it. Or like, this is really bad, uh, you know? And I think as we've grown and we're able to absorb blows a little bit more, my subconscious mind immediately is like, this is a big deal. This is a problem. And then I have to unwind that and be like, look, I can solve this. You know, my favorite quote in the world is, uh, things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes them so, right? Um, and so I'm like, okay, I can reframe this. But I think that in the moment, it's very easy to fall into kind of what you fell into there, especially losing as much as you did and to fall into drinking and like then the DUI. And I can only imagine what your like state of mind is at that point. And of course, you look back now and it's a great lesson for everybody oh, else, yeah. you know, and you're just like, obviously that made you, thank God, you know, that oh, yeah, that, that oh, happened, thank God, right? Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, and how's the relationship with your father now? Is it? Is oh, it it's good? amazing, yeah. man. I've, I've been able to retire him. I've been able to, uh, uh, you know, um, well, we're buying them a house this year, which is Beautiful. pretty awesome, uh, which in California for a million bucks, you get like a condo yeah, with a small one bedroom. Little, yeah, one bedroom place, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so that's pretty awesome. But, you know, it took a while to, to gain back his, his respect. It took a while to, to kind of like, you know, because he was also skeptical of all the things that came after, you know? It was like, all right, well, yeah, you're trying this and you're trying that, but who said it's not going to turn another one of these, you yeah. know what I mean? And it took a while, and it will take a while. It's not going to be something where it'll just happen, you know, overnight. And, and I know people talk about, um, you know, they 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 see the the um, they see the the glory, but no one really talks about like the bullshit that happens before the glory because yes, it is an overnight success that's been in the works for 20 years. Sure. You know what I mean? I think like you had said uh, when we talked about money earlier, one way or another subconsciously, you probably are very cautious with your money when you, you know, you saw your dad lose it all, then you lost it all through the fire. Like, so there has to be some kind of programming in your mind that's like, you know, Bashar, hold on to this money because you don't know what's going what it's, which is good because if you come into money very quickly, it's very easy for it to just go right out the door the same way that it came in. And this is what happened to me um, when I was given money because I was given money. Although I didn't party, I didn't go out, I didn't blow it on, um, on stupid shit, but I did blow it on stupid shit. 
because I wasn't spending it wisely. Although, yes, it was being invested in the business, but it wasn't being invested in the right places, you know? I didn't know how to create, you know, budgets and PLs and, you know, figuring out, like I would have someone ask me, you know, what's your, what's your cost into each one of these plates? It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, do you guys portion things? What do you mean by portioning things, you know? <laughs> And so, like all these things, I I didn't know, and and I wasn't open to to knowing, and that's where a lot of people also make the mistake, is that look, no one comes out of their mom with with a PhD and knowing everything. It's just you need to be able to go through life, and and take the lessons, and 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 I think you know, uh, um, like my the very first advice I ever got from anyone was from, from my brother. I think I was like six, seven years old. I don't know what happened. I think I fell and broke my foot or something. And I was crying and my brother hugged me and he said, everything happens for a reason. Uh, he obviously said in, in, in Arabic, but you know, that's what it translates to. And, um, and now every time something happens, no matter how traumatic, I always think everything happens for a reason. And in fact, now every time a crisis happens in my life, the bigger the crisis, the more excited I get. Yeah. Although I I I am fear fearful and like insanely like I, I'm just like I don't want to be in this situation, but I know that this is a a, a time for me to learn and grow. I I was living I, every month. I have a, a quote that I write on my board that I kind of live by every month. And last month was thank you life for being difficult because it is through difficult through difficulties that we learn and grow. Yep. And um, and this is kind of what I've experienced, you know, through the restaurant, through building a business, and then uh, everything else. It's it's, um, it's just that everything happens for a reason. So let's talk about, uh, you moved to the transition to the online world. You opened up the laptop. You said earlier, like, you know, hey, this is, you're supposed to make me money. What did you stumble across? How did you get in the online world? And then I want to get into some real tactical stuff, but I think we should just transition the story now you know, deep depression, didn't know the way out to like actually starting to make some money online. And, and now you finally saw a, a, a roadmap forward. How did you come across it? What did that look like? Yeah. And, and, you know, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, although I had only known her for so long, she kind of believed in me more than I did. Wow. And she was like, Hey man, look, like this is just a hiccup. It's just, it is what it is. Like, because she, I always used to talk big and stuff like that. And although you know, although like at the time now thinking about it, it wasn't really that big, but it's like <laughs> to what she was used to or like the friends that we had it was big talk, you know? And she was like, I know you're going to do something with your life. I don't know what yet, but don't just give up. And um, it was a couple of things. So the first thing was uh, I got recognized by, so I started working for Hilton Hotels as a dishwasher and I started driving for Uber. And um, during you know, while I was driving for Uber, I started making connections. Like just, I would just talk people's ears off <laughs> and I would literally So have, you were that kind of Uber driver, I huh? was that kind of Uber driver <laughs> until they would tell me, hey bro, I'm just trying to get to my place. Like, you know, I'm just trying to listen to my thing or whatever, you know, or they would put their headphones on, you know? I was trying to collect as many phone numbers. I was trying to like do something and I didn't know what I was doing. And then I started hearing all these people doing all these different things. And like someone would walk into my car and I would look at them like, dude, you look like you're a nobody. And then they're telling me about their journey. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I, that could be me sitting in the back, you know? And um, and then I started driving, uh, working for Hilton Hotels. And uh, um, the, the kitchen manager, um, the kitchen supervisor actually recognized me because he was one of the, the purveyors that used to deliver uh, food to our uh, restaurant. He used to work for one of the, the, the purveyors that would deliver. And he's like, what the hell are you doing here? And so I explained to him, and it's like, hey, man, I've got an opening in the kitchen if you want to be a kitchen manager, 60K a year. This was 2015. 60K a year plus benefits plus BTO plus all that. At the time, I was like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. Yeah. You know? Like, I hadn't made 60K ever, you know? Because <laughs> in my restaurant, I was not making money. I was losing money every single month. And um, and so I started doing the math. By the time, I, at the time, I was about 150K in debt. Oh, wow. Um, I owed the IRS like 47,000. Steve sued me, who was my landlord. Um, and I had all these like different things that I had to pay. And so I'm doing the math. I'm like, after 60K, I'm trying to get married. You know, how much do I have left paying debt? It was going to take me like 18 years just to clear my debt. And I'm like, fuck that. There's got to be another way. And um, I had met a friend a few months prior who told me that he worked from home. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And he's like, I work from home. And I'm like, 
what do you mean by you work from home? Like to me, you know, again, being in a restaurant business, it's like, yeah, you go to work, you, people come, you do a service or product and then they, you know, exchange money. And like what I, year was this too? 2015. Yeah, so even way before everybody knew what work from home was Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, what, I, I don't know what he did exactly, but I think he was like a programmer or something like that. Um, and so he's like, yeah, dude, there's like, people make money online. I'm like, no shit. I'm like, how? Do any what? It's like, just research YouTube. I'm like, the fuck is that? You know? <laughs> and so I got on YouTube. I had this like three inch uh, thick laptop, Toshiba laptop. I still have it just to remind me. <laughs> and um, I went to Starbucks, opened it, literally went on YouTube and I said, hey man, you're supposed to make me money. Show me how, literally. And I started typing like how to make money online, you know? And, and, and every, it's like this new world opened up and I was like, holy shit. And then I'm 25 years old and I see all these 17, 18 year old kids running around in Lamborghinis and I'm like, what the fuck has been going on here? <laughs> where have I lived? <laughs> like, and that's where the ego came even in. came in, bigger than ever. And uh, even because even Amazon, after having lost almost half a million dollars, you would think that I would get a coach or a mentor, you know, courses and stuff like that. It's like, no. If an 18-year-old can do it, I can do it. This motherfucker have, has nothing on me. I can figure this out. And so I went and borrowed $5,000 from my mother, who's now my mother-in-law. I had just met her daughter six months, seven months. And being Middle Eastern, you don't just go and date my daughter and, and go, you know, uh, go drive around and stuff like that. If you want to date my daughter, you need to come propose, you know? So not only was I dating their daughter, I, I, I borrowed money from them. Oh, my gosh. Um, which, by the way, Lost it all, <laughs> launched a few products, didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then there was this 18 year old kid in a tank top, the shittiest course I've ever taken in my, in my life ever, 497. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. He's got to do it. Called my girlfriend. I'm like, hey, you trust me? She said, yes, but why? Very skeptical. I was like, I need your car number. For what? Just trust me on this. Your car number. Gave me the car number put the course on her card, sat at Starbucks from like 10, 11 o'clock. It was a short course. I finished it in one day. I was like, fuck, I wish I didn't put that money into these products because I knew exactly the mistake that I made. It was very simple. I, I had launched a seasonal product. By the time I got to Amazon, it was off season. So I, you know, the other one was competitive. The other one wasn't differentiated correctly, whatever. So I went and borrowed more money. I'm already 150K in debt. I've already borrowed $5,000 from my mother-in-law. I went and borrowed another 70 something hundred dollars from like a few friends. And um, and then I launched my- You got a lot product. of good friends and people, I'll tell you that. A lot of people that are so betting on you, that's pretty impressive. You know, I've had two friends that went to high school with me that are pretty good friends still. Both of them said, go fuck yourself. I'm not lending you money. <laughs> I you're probably would have said that you know? it's like, I probably would have said that to you. It's like, dude, yeah. I've, I've worked hard for this money. <laughs> and the people that did, did lend me the money were actually people that I didn't really know that much. Really? You know? And um, Maybe that's why they didn't know that you were a bad yeah, guy. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and you know what? Those people, there were especially two of them, I've told them whatever you want, anytime you want. You want a million dollars, you will get it tomorrow morning. No yeah. problem. Wow. You know? Um, no one has called yet. <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> hopefully they're not listening to this podcast right now. Uh. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but no, seriously, whatever they want, because they were there for me, you know? And uh, one of them gave me 5,000. Uh, the other one gave me like 2,200, 2,300, something like that. Wow. And uh, and so I was another, you know, 15, 16K in the hole on top of the 150K. And, uh, and I just went for it, man. And first product, started making money. Second product, started making money. I was like, shit, this is something, you know? And it took like seven, eight months until I paid the first couple of people off. My mother-in-law didn't get paid until like a year and a half later. We almost were about to get married. My <laughs> wife is like, uh, I think we need to pay my mom soon. You know, I was like, all right, you know. And um, and so, yeah, man, this is how I how I got started, you know. But it was, it was a lot of trial and error in the beginning. And it was a lot of mistakes. And again, it's like sometimes you think you've learned your lesson, but you really haven't, Yeah. you know. And then I just realized that. And then since then... I've become very obsessed with mentors and coaches. This year so far, we've invested 570-something thousand in coaching consultants, mentors, you know, just for myself and my company. And what do you, uh, I'd, I'd love to transition into that for a moment. Like, you know, obviously a company doing multiple eight figures a year, what are you investing in for mentors and what are you doing for your company? Where's some of that 570 going? I mean, you know the name names, but like what kind of uh, mentors yeah. were they? So specific masterminds for the leaders, Okay. Um, like a, a sales training for our sales, uh, head of sales, $50,000 a year right there. 
um, with uh, with a mastermind I'm in with a, a couple of our leadership. We pay combined, uh, all four of us, we pay about $76,000 a year. Um, I am in four, uh, three different masterminds, which I'm going to be dropping out of and staying with just one. Um, recently, I went on a, um, a three months, two and a half months ago, I went on a... Um, a kind of like a, 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 a coaching tangent. And I was like, I want this and this and this. And masterminds are great, but you know, I'm like, how can I squeeze the one year into one hour, two hours? So I made a list of people that I want to have a one-on-one -on -one with. And I just reached out and I said, hey, what's your price? Name it. I'll pay you. I want two, three hours with you. So I reached out to people like Dan Locke, Ty Lopez, Dean Graziosi, uh, and paying them 10, 15, $25,000 an hour and just getting on a one-hour call with them. And, you know, have a list of questions and then ask and say, and, you know, next month I'll come up, well, come up with more questions and then go implement in the business. Now, obviously someone listening, they'd be like, well, dude, I, I don't have $10,000 to go drop on in one hour. It's like, yeah, but that's not where I started. My first course was $500 sure. seven years ago, but I've built up to it, you know? And so right now it's, it's investing in talent, you know, overpaying my team. Um, bonuses, you know, I think we overpay the shit out of our team and I love it. <laughs> um, next, uh, Friday, next weekend, we have our first ever, uh, company get together. Nice. You know, we're blowing al almost $150,000 on this on three day event, you know, we're making ours a company retreat. Look back. We got ours in a few <laughs> weeks. I don't know if, if my team's listening there. We, I don't know what that's the budget for it, but, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, we're going over the top and, uh, uh um, so just doing things like that, man, investing in, in, in the company, investing and again, because I don't invest in anything. So it's like, what's the cash sitting in the bank for? Sure. Um, obviously, you do want to, you do like the profit, <laughs> but then it's like, but what is it doing really? Yeah. So it's like, all right, let's reinvest back in the business. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, exactly. Someone argued it's an investment in itself, oh, back in the team, back Absolutely. in it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. which I, I 100 percent can get behind. Give me just for the people that are listening, because I got I got a mix of people that are listening to this podcast. I got people who are just starting out, but also we have eight <laughs> figure guys that are listening to this as well. So out of the different guys you listen to or gals for like the ten, fifteen thousand dollars an hour, what was one or two of the biggest kind of takeaways that you could distill down for people that are listening that was like like, you know, which is difficult to do because I know that you're already condensing so much down to an hour and then to condense that down even further. But like, what was something that you were like, damn, I didn't think of looking at like that. Mm. Dean said, um he said, so we're in the process of, of re, and this is probably for the, the guy that's doing seven, eight figures, you know, um, we're, we're currently in the process of like rebuilding our processes because we've literally built a, a multi eight figure company with one product, one funnel, one everything and Google sheets and zaps. <laughs> we, our zap, we, we do about half a million zaps a month, Yeah, you know? And so one day I was looking at this and I'm like, dude, I don't think Apple runs like that. I don't <laughs> think Microsoft runs like that. Like something is broken here, you know? And uh, so we, we've, um, we've completely shifted and, and gone into like building systems, building processes. We're integrating EOS. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're integrating EOS. We uh, had all the leadership read uh, uh, Rocket Fuel, read Traction, incredible books. And, um, and so Dean said, he said, you know, it's good, to, um, it's good to sometimes take a break and just slow down for a quick second. And if it takes two months, if it takes six months, if it takes 12 months, to build so that way you get you get ready for the next thing. And just do know that if you have envision in your mind that you're not going to stop at 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, build it to last. Yeah. Build something today that's going to last all these levels. So now when our, you know, soon to be integrator comes to me and says, hey, you know, we've got the system. <clears throat> we can go with this as $2,000 or we can go with this $10,000. The 2000 can probably get us to this. 10000 can get us to that. It's like, no, go through the 10000 yeah. It's a bigger cost, but we're not going to need to stop in two years and say, oh, we need to redo this thing. Let's just do it right because I know we're not going to stop here. We're going to a billion and plus, you know, yeah. so let's let's get, just build it right. Hey guys, really quickly, if you're getting value out of this, please be sure to share it wherever you share things. Share it with your friends, your colleagues, your employees, share it to somebody that you know needs to hear this message. We put an incredible amount of work into these videos and these episodes for you. And all I ask in return is for simply to share it to somebody else that wants to hear that or needs to hear this message. All right, let's get back to it. And it, it goes right back to the theme that we're talking about earlier, which is the longer term vision, right? Yes. It's having the longer term vision. Let's let's transition a little bit over to the business, just for people who aren't um, aware. Walk us through. Obviously, you were doing the e um, e commerce, Amazon specifically. You were incredibly successful with that. Now you run an e learning platform around us. Can you kind of explain to us what you do in the main business that you have currently? Yeah. So um, it started in 2018. I, I was uh, with uh, with my wife's cousin. 
And uh, there, it's a question that I almost, I don't know, maybe I asked you uh, when we you know, had dinner. He said, um, where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? And I stared at him for like five minutes. I'm like, fuck, I have no clue. He's like, not an Amazon seller? Like, I thought you do very well. I'm like, I do. And it's like, so? I'm like, I don't know, man. And at the time, you know, I was, um, so this was late 2018. I was a, a seven-figure seller. Uh, I think just cracked seven figures, you know, was probably making ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 a month in profits, spending like 30 minutes a day. Because with Amazon, once you build it, you've got some VAs running and stuff like that. It's, it's very, like, it's pretty systematic. You know, Amazon makes it pretty uh, easy for you. And, um, but I just had lost, like when I first started, it was the, it was, I want to, I want to get out of debt. I want to do something. It was away from fear. Right. It was away from fear. I want, I'm 150K in debt. I met someone that's special for me. And I want to make sure that I offer the kind of life that I really would want my wife to have. I want to gain the respect back of my parents. I want to retire them. I want to buy them a house. I want to do this. I want to do that. And so I had accomplished most of those things. And then that, that drive stopped. There was no more drive. And so, you know, waking up at eight became nine, nine became 10, 10 became 11. I was like, okay, there's something here. There's something wrong here. And around that same time, you know, because for about two, three years while I was building, I went away. Once I came back to the world, a few friends were like, hey, dude, where the hell have you been up to? <laughs> this. Oh, cool. What does this teach me? And I had taught a few friends. And one day I got a, a text message. This guy, Zach Brown, he said, Bashar, you're the fucking man. In the last six months, I made $36,000 in profits. And the, the profits were cool. But the thing that was really cool about it is that I got on the phone with him and he's like, 23-year-old kid from North Carolina, he said, the thing that he was always passionate about is he would take his dirt bike and he would travel around the country, go in tournaments and stuff like that, and would like borrow money from here and there just to make it happen. But now this 23-year-old kid had a business that's running on autopilot that can do go and do whatever the hell he wants and enjoy and, and, and chase after his passion while his finances are taken care of. And I saw the impact. And I was like, holy shit, not only can I gain the respect of my dad back and fix my finances in my life, but I could do the same for people. And that's when it became kind of like my calling almost. You know, it's like, I'm kind of obligated here. You know, like it's almost unfair that I know this stuff and that I'm not sharing it with the world. So this is when I went on YouTube and stuff like that. So today we run uh, BJK University. Uh, it's a, an education uh, platform with the mission to impact 1 million lives. Um, today, we're focused only on Amazon. Uh, currently, we only have one product, which is an Amazon FBA coaching program, uh, seven weekly webinars. We have mindset training and all that. Uh, but next year, we're, we're thinking of launching a mastermind, probably launching software. And then we want to scale within Amazon as vertical as possible. But then come 2024, we want to go into other horizontals. Because the reason why we named it BJK University and not you know FBA training or something like that, it's because my vision was, I want to create a platform where people can, you don't go to college to learn, you know, to become an engineer or to become this or that. You go and you have all these options. So we want to provide people a skill because regardless who you are, you want better life. In order for you to have a better life, you need to up your skill level. So we want to provide people with a skill that within 90 days or less, they can turn into income. Um, without wasting tens of you know years and tens of thousands learning shit they'll never use going to traditional school, right? And so that's where BJK University is and where it's going to be in the next future. When you name uh, BJK University, did you think I'm going to turn this into multiple different products, or was it just like something that rolled off the tongue? The university part, yes, I did have I did have I I did have the idea of I don't want to just stick with Amazon. Uh, but I didn't know, I don't think I knew how big it could get. Yeah. I, I. So when I created Scaling with Systems, like the main goal was the current business that we have right now. But then even in the past year, I think what really opened my eyes was when Hormozzi exited his company mm -hmm. for uh, multiple eight, almost nine figures. And he had been at my house like six months before he exited, right? Um, and so he, him and I were talking and I think he was almost like, like the Roger Bannister, I don't know if you know the four minute mile story, right? Yeah. And uh, no one had done it, then he did it, then a hundred people did it in the next 12 months. And so when he, when Hermosi had done it, I was like, I, I just didn't think it was possible to exit a um, education company, mm -hmm. right? And not that I would ever even want to, but it's nice to have that opportunity, you know, sure. essentially where the business owner is not the face of it. BJK is the face of it. You're not the face of it as well, right? right? And so for me, scaling systems, it happened to be called scaling systems and we trademarked it. But our three to five year goal is also to start because like what you said with me, education, mentorship online totally transformed my life. And I, I do think it's unfair in the sense that 
it still blows my mind even today when people are like, just like, I have to go to college. I have to do that. And I want everybody to do whatever they want to do. Right. I just think that people aren't aware of the other options out yeah. there, right? I don't I, think they should go to college. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very strong on that. Okay, don't fair. fucking go to college. Okay, that's fair. Don't right, do right. it. <laughs> um, they, they sponsor this show, so I have to be careful. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, but my goal was also to create an acquisition company that Scaleless is with the holding company, and then we would acquire other companies uh, that would be able to teach different skills. Sure. So like one would be remote integration, one could be sales, one could be ops, whatever it is as well. And um and I think, like you said as well, when I when I came to a certain point in scaling the systems, I almost felt exactly what you were naming a little bit there, where it was like, I don't want to say flatlining, but I did feel like some of the mo- like once you have enough money that where you can get relatively speaking anything you want. I mean, I'm not buying like jets, but sure. you know, uh, I will buy a jet next year, but not a, a huge jet when I can fly myself. <laughs> but I like I kind of lost that, and I think that that next level up for me was going to be the acquisitions game um, and get into other uh, other points. But I think the really coolest one of the coolest things that you've done is the focus you've done with one product, one service, one funnel. So like, let's walk through that a little bit. I know your main acquisition channel is like one thing. And when I talk to you, you're like, hey, how are you going to do grow to, to this number? And you were like, I'm just going to do more of this one thing. And, yeah. I, and I was like, wow, that's insane. So I just want to get an understanding from you. When you were scaling the business and you started acqu- uh, you started like growing, did you test multiple different channels out? Are you still constantly testing other channels out? Like for the person that's listening to this, they have one channel that works. Uh, should they continue to scale that up? Should they look at other channels to kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, diversify diversify their traffic sources in case one goes down. What sure. are your thought process around that? So, like. Almost, you know, when I spoke, when I first joined Russell Brunson's mastermind, he said, diversify your marketing. Uh, you know, when I talked to Dan, Dan, uh, Dan Locke, he said, the worst number of, in business is one. Hmm. And uh, and that's why I didn't talk to him again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I've been talking to him. So. But, you know, I was like, you know, he's achieved higher success than me. So maybe when I'm at his level, I'll look back and I'll say, yep, that was stupid. He was right. But right now, I don't think that's right. Um, to your question, yes, I had tried everything. Uh, so when I first joined uh, Sam Ovens, uh, which was the f- one of the first, not one of, but the first uh, 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 consulting course that I took about consulting. Prior to that was just Amazon, all that stuff, how to sell on Amazon. But once I wanted to learn how to how to scale my consulting business, Sam was the man, you know. And um, and so I learned the VSL thing. I learned Facebook ads, and I scaled to about 150k a month with Facebook ads by myself, running marketing, sales, uh, coaching running an Amazon business still. I was just a one-man show doing it all. You know, seven-figure a year, multiple seven-figure business here. I was like, shit, life is good. And then I woke up and Facebook ads were gone. You know, shut down. And then it was just a battle for three months. And then I tried to do uh, YouTube ads. And then I I think I joined Alex Becker's. And, uh, and I was just like, dude, this is just too complicated. So I hired an agency to do my YouTube ads. And um, and it was just breaking even. That never even. works. Yeah, it, that never it was works. just breaking even, you know? And then one of them was like, hey, dude, have you tried influencer marketing? I've got a client that's doing influencer marketing on Instagram. And it's blowing up. I was like, no shit. So I went and I checked it out. I'm like, this is cool. I, and I started just reaching out to like motivational pages. Hey, man, post this on your page. Drive traffic to me. Drive traffic to the link in bio, blah, blah, blah. One of the page owners reached out. And he's like, hey, bro, um, I see what you want to do. But what you're doing sucks. I can do it better. Pay me this much a month. I'll do it for you. Cool. Um, and so little by little, it just became a thing. And then I was, you know, I, uh, when I joined, uh, Sam Evans mastermind in 2020, I see Sam up because to me, Sam Evans is like this cool, slick back hair, you know, Manhattan apartment. And then I, and I joined the, 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 the mastermind and I'm looking at Sam and Sam is like this long you got hair. The California it Sam. looks like, <laughs> it, well, no, not even. He looks like Jesus and he's in a forest in New Zealand. Oh, that's This right. was during yeah. COVID. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And he's like, and he was talking about how he's gone off social media, YouTube, all that. And I'm like, yep, that's what I want to do. So I stopped posting everywhere. And then I fired the agency and I'm like, I'm just going to learn how to do YouTube ads. And I'm going to like go in my cave and go in my lab and then just figure it out. And that just wasn't working. And then I was telling the Instagram guys, I'm like, hey, look, this month we're going to pull the plug. And they're like, just give us one month. And this was uh, October of 2020. So it was... 10,000 a month in profits and then 20,000 a month and then 30,000 a month. I'm like, shit, this is going somewhere. And then 2021 came around. We were two people. It was me and, and our head of sales now. And then it was two in the marketing team. This was 2021. We did 150. 2022, we did 
of January of 2023, uh, 2022. And uh, this year so far, I've done a little over 12 million. So, but again, over the last three months, we flatlined, you know, and this is where, all right, it's not about like from zero to seven figures, it was just having an offer that sells, I think. Uh, and then seven, eight figures was figuring out like having sales, but figuring out a marketing strategy. And then I think now eight to nine, it's a a solid business. And I've seen a lot of people come and go, come and go, come and come to this like $1 million a month and go, $1 million a month and go. And I've realized that they get to this point of, because I think a lot of us get into this game because I'm a marketer, I, want, I can sell shit. And then it gets to this point where it's not a marketing game anymore. It's not a sales game anymore. I need to build a fucking real business. I need to have real C I need to do the real CEO shit. Yeah. I need to have a COO and I need to have an, an entire executive team and I need to do all this like complicated shit where people in suits are gonna come into my house and shit, you know? And I think this is where people are like, nope, I can probably jump into this other niche and then do this thing again. And that's why you see this whole guru like niche hopping thing. Every, you know, 6, 12, 18 months, you see this same guy just going from one niche to another and building a completely new company, new offer. I'm like, dude, I'm not in the business of offers. Yeah. I don't have an offer. Like when people say, how many offers do you have? I'm like, what the fuck is that? Dude, I'm a real company. We've got, where we have one product line and then, we, you know, this is where we want to go. And so this is why when people like marketers call it offers, I'm like, that's fucked. You know, so now it's about building systems, having people that believe in the in the vision, and this is very important as well. Is that you need to have a vision that's bigger than yourself, bigger than your team, bigger than anything else, and preferably it's not attainable in your lifetime, in their lifetime, in your kids' lifetime, and their kids' lifetime. It's something so large, so massive that you can't even you can't even fathom. It's like the universe. Like, how does this guy and oceans and like every time we try to think about it, it's like, how the fuck does that work? But we believe, we have faith. You know. Um, and so it needs to be something so large. The magnitude has to be so large where you don't even understand it, but you're so fucking excited about it. And you wake up and Tony Robbins, I recently joined his mastermind, which I didn't even know that Tony has had a mastermind. He talks about how it's easier to have something that pulls you instead of having some, instead of pushing all the time. Because when you're pushing all the time, you need to be motivated every morning, right? But when you've got something so large in the future, that's just pulling you, you don't need motivation, man. You just wake up and it's like, let's go. I think that one of the coolest things you said there was like the the eight to nine figures thing you said was like systems and building the systems out. And we're discovering that ourselves. And I think another way to put it as well is like, like a team. I think the team is really, yes. most people that are at the seven figures, they have like a marketer, they have sales guys, and then they have one client success person that's handling 600 clients, right? It's like, it's not really... And, and I think you talk about Sam Ovens a lot as well, who I think is an absolute goat. And I joined his high level mastermind, I think in 2019. I ended up actually only doing one thing ever, which is I went to one in-person mastermind. I had lived in, I was living in San Diego and he had one in LA and I ended up going to that. And, um, uh, that was still one of the most, the best masterminds I've ever been to only because I remember he brought up vision, mission, and values. And I remember thinking like, what the fuck, dude? I just paid like 40 grand and I needed to know Facebook ads and you're talking to me about <laughs> the vision, fucking values and vision and mission. And I'm I'm there with my buddy and I'm like, dude, this is ridiculous. I can't believe we did this. Like I, I got to get, I just got shut off of Facebook ads. I want to know YouTube ads. And I was like, all right, whatever. I paid the money. And so I still remember what he had me do was write, or everyone was write down what, everything you hate in somebody else, and the opposite of that was your your values for your company, right? And it was then that I finally, I don't even think I understood it then, um, but I started to understand a little bit there, like, okay, like maybe this does make sense. And then he said something that I never forgot, which was that the values just simply become how decision-making happens to your company when you're not there. Right, so when you're presented with a problem, uh, you're. Let me rephrase that. When your team is presented with a problem, you know you have two options. You have this option over here, or you have the option that what would the values do? Not right. what would Ravi do? What would the values do? And I think that's been. I have heart values. So I even made a post. Like I have a reminder every week to remind our team in some way or another a story about how we should be embodying our values, and it's just so funny because. It's almost like Mavlov's hierarchy of needs. At like when you're just like trying to make your first million or first few million dollars, you're just like doing whatever you need to do. And I think you can hustle to make it happen. But to make multiple eight figures, yeah, you gotta start talking like vision. What do you mean you gotta talk about vision? Like yeah. that? No, no, no. You just gotta work harder. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's all you gotta do. And yeah. you gotta start painting a vision. And then I forgot the book that I read, but it's by Peter Drucker. Uh, Drucker, and he talks about it's executive something. But anyway. 
uh, he talks about that most CEOs are not actually CEOs. Most executive uh, officers are not actually doing the work of executive officers. And I realized that that was also me. Mm -hmm. I love ads and I'm a marketer. I love marketing. But the problem was that I wasn't, I'm the CEO of the company, yet here I am being really what was a CMO's job. I was right. literally doing all of the marketing. I was like, wanted to be in charge of everything. So I ended up hiring uh, Jack, our creative director here. I ended up hiring a chief marketing officer. And like, sometimes I just want to like, go put my hands in there yeah. and change everything. But I know, going back to what you said earlier, in order for us to get to where I want to go, in order to get a nine-figure mark, I ha even if it were moving slower, even if um, I think that it should be done differently, I have to kind of remove myself from that yes, process. absolutely. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, um, I, I, in the beginning of this year, I, I, I told our, our, um, our executives, I'm like, look, look at me as a, a council and a source of resources. Like, there are some things that you might do that I might not agree with, but at the end of the day, it's your decision. You make the decision. If you fuck up and make a mistake, great, no problem. Let's learn from it. Let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Now, if it keeps happening, there's a problem that we need to really correct. But unless they learn how to do it, because you're not going to be there every day. They're the ones hiring and firing. They're the ones running their teams. And they need to be able to know how to run their teams. And if that doesn't work, then you just have the wrong person in the right seat. And you just got to swap them, you know? Um, so that's very important, delegating and just removing yourself. All you're doing is re you're firing yourself up. I want to ask you a question that um, I don't get to ask a lot of people because they're not at the level that you're at. But I think it's... I always tell everybody this. I think the most underrated, undervalued, and underexperienced thing that CEOs will ever do is hiring and managing talent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, once again, I just said earlier that I think that's the thing that separates you from seven to eight, maybe even eight to nine. It's just really, really great people in the yeah. company, staying with the company. Walk me through some lessons that you've learned either on the hiring process, maybe on the um, on the like the team leadership process, the delegation. What are some of the lessons you had to maybe even learn the hard way that the people that are listening to this can take away from it when they're trying to find their first you know, executive member or keep their first executive member or something along those lines? So I've never hired into an executive seat before. Um, and it worked this way. <clears throat> we're about to do, well, we're not even going to do that now. But it's always been because everyone that like was with me kind of grew with me and then they, it just made sense for them to take the executive seats. Right. Interesting. Um, for the first time now we're so my integrator, um, we were not even hiring her into the integrator seat. It just so happened in November of last year, she was on a call with one of our closers to become a student. Hmm. And he's like, we were hiring sales teams. And he's like, dude, you need to be on this other side. She became a sales rep, did very well. But then we realized that she has a lot more, she has like, she's like superwoman. And we brought her up to do um, ops. And then from there, we we tried to move into uh, Salesforce and that completely botched. Um, I was leading that and I was like, dude, I never want to do anything I like that. I remember we I'm, talked about I that. I am not a project manager. <laughs> That's not what I do. I'm a visionary. Don't freaking tell me to like manage it. That's not what I do, you know? And then she came on and, and led the, the migration into HubSpot. And it's been incredible. And to like every person that doesn't even know what an integrator is, is like, that's our integrator. Yeah. It just, it makes absolute sense. And so next week we're actually meeting uh, uh, to kind of like finalize things, but she's pretty much, she's been in the integrator seat. But again, she I wasn't looking for an integrator and I went out and hired someone. So I think obviously when you're just building a company, it's easier to like build together. I never looked at resumes. I, in fact, I never even asked about experience. When I have an, when I was doing interviews, um, I would have questions about personal life. And I just want to have a conversation with you and see if we vibe. Like, so people talk about gut. Like, you know, that just have a weird gut feeling. I've got a good gut feeling about this. You know, my gut, this and that. And what I realized that we actually have three brains. We have one here, one in our heart, and one in our stomach. And there's a reason why sometimes like when you're in a bad situation, you feel this like, you know, stomach turning. When you see, you know, your high school crush, you have butterflies in your stomach. Well, because we have a brain in our stomach. And that's the whole wisdom thing I was talking about earlier. And if we, if you're like a visionary type, which like just a dreamer, just want to go to the moon and stuff like that, then which a lot of founders are, what you want to do is you want to personally, I go after my gut feeling, man. If I have a great feeling after having a 30 minute conversation with someone, I'm going to give them a shot. If not, I'm just going to move on, you know? And I'm just asking like random ass questions. And like, I don't even have a, like, it's like a list of like 10 questions that I have. And I'll just pull from here and here and here, you know? If it's like awkward, it's just like, 
dude, get the fuck out of here. Yep. You know? Because we have a, like, especially for us, we've got a very high energy team. They're fucking maniacs. They're crazy, <laughs> you know? And so if I bring someone that's like dead, low energy, stuff like that, like sometimes we'll bring on a contractor or something, um, or like a, like a trainer or something like that, and then they'll do like a presentation for the team. And then like if they're not vibing at the same level, I'm just like, this motherfucker gotta get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Like we're just about to die right now. <laughs> because our meetings are like fucking crazy. Like, have you seen Tony Robbins? Yeah. Like that kind of shit, you know? And uh, um, this is how we vibe, you know, and I want someone to vibe at that same level. That's just who we are. And so when it comes to hiring, it's almost more of like, look, anyone that comes in, we're on a three month, we're, we're gonna get engaged for three months. If we like each, each other, we'll get married. Otherwise, no, no, no hard, no hard feelings. We'll pay you for whatever you're owed and you go your separate ways. And then so it's very important to bring someone on. Um, executive level, fuck, man, it's difficult to hire from outside. It's a lot easier to hire from inside and just hire up. You're, it's like, it's so interesting because it's very rare I find somebody that actually recommends hiring inside because the question is like, let's say for um, uh, chief marketing officer, sure. right? If you've never been a chief marketing officer, and this person that you're just hiring, maybe they're running your ads for you, has never been a chief marketing officer, then how does anybody know what the hell a chief marketing officer should be doing? So something that we uh, talk about a lot is that a skill could be taught, but culture must be a fit. If you are willing, if you're fucking willing, like you vibe and you're willing and you see the vision and you're here to stay and you're just a diehard BJKU fan, I can teach you anything because I will go and pay someone to come consult you. And all of our executives, we're paying for all of them to be consulted by seven, eight-figure sellers and coaches and, and, and all this stuff, right? Um, we have people that used to be, used to write copy for Tony, or used to write copy for all these people, coaching our internal copywriting team, right? As long as they have the potential and they have the, the, the bandwidth to become, then we will make it happen. Um, our head of marketing are 21 and 22-year-olds you know, that literally never ran a company in their lives. Now they've got a team of nine. How do they do it? They had the vision. They had the potential. They had the, the, the desire. They had the hunger. In fact, all of, you know, like late 2021, they were telling me how they wanted to, to like, like they were setting the goals for the sales team, you know, because I thought I was dreaming big and these motherfuckers want to double their results every month. And I'm like, dude, you guys got to chill the fuck out, you know? <laughs> and so, but then the, you know, like they didn't have leadership qualities and shit, I didn't have leadership qualities two years ago. I didn't have leadership qualities last week. You know, <laughs> I'm still building into a leader. Like that's one of my goals is to become one of the greatest leaders, you know? And so it's like, well, if you, like if you've been able to grow yourself into this thing, why don't you expect others to do the same thing? Now I get it. Yeah, it's, it's you know, going and bringing people that are at, I'm not sure what kind of people you've been talking to, but like when you look at corporations, Culture isn't really a huge thing for sure. them. You know, for us, it's big. Like, that's the, literally the, the biggest thing. This is how we make decisions. You know what you were saying earlier about core values? Yeah. This is how we make decisions. We have our core values. We we talk about them every single Monday uh, meeting, every single sales meeting, every single marketing meeting. They talk about the, you know, they repeat them. We talk about them almost half a dozen times a week, right? And so we're, we're all very immersed in the core values. And if you don't resonate, you'll either fall out yourself or, or we'll just let you go. So we always say that a culture must be a fit, but a skill could be taught. Absolutely at no point would I ever hire somebody who was talented in the position but was not a culture fit. Because like you said, I've done that before and it doesn't matter because if they're a sole like lone wolf and they don't fit culture-wise, that person's not going to be there long, right? right? Either they're going to scare away your great talent or they're going to get scared away from your other talent. And I think Steven Schwarzman, uh, the, one of the founders of BlackRock, he talks about – he calls it the airport test. And he says that when you're interviewing with someone, if you can't see yourself stuck in an airport with them for four plus hours and having a good time, then don't hire that yeah, person. And that's, that's literally good. the way that we look at it as well. That's good. Uh, Bashar, unbelievable podcast, my man. Appreciate I really do it, appreciate you being on here. I absolutely enjoyed it so much. I learned quite a bit. I hope everybody else did here as well. I know you don't do a lot of these also. We were just talking about you've only done three and I don't know how long, right? So I'm super grateful that you had, uh, chose to do one of them with us. For people to listen, 
listening to this, uh, whether they're an entrepreneur and they just want to follow you because you're obviously crushing it, or maybe it's somebody who heard about that online thing and they're like, hey, I want to make some money online. What's the best way people can get in touch with you, follow you, learn a little bit more about you? Um, I would say Instagram is the best way. Just go to Instagram, type Bashar you get to make sure when you type that name, there's going to be probably 12 different <laughs> accounts because there's a bunch of people faking my name uh, out there. Uh, we have 2.6 million followers, so you're not going to miss it. <laughs> Make sure you follow that account, but follow us on Instagram. Check out the, the information there and go from there. Beautiful, and we'll drop it in the show notes down below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.